blind in, blind in light. Uh, but on behalf of uh, the Blue Stocking Bookstore, on behalf of the uh, Beaver location, Beaver Street location, I think. Yes. Uh, on behalf of Midnight Notes, uh, we would like to welcome visitors from afar, from Bristol, England, the home of the slave trade and mercantilism. Boo! Uh, to New York City, right across from the Customs House. Boo! Here we are, right down from Wall Street. Boo! Boo! We want to give a rah-rah to our comrades uh, from the Radical History Group of Bristol, England, which has uh, renewed our energies uh, transatlantic against slavery, against the Wall Street. And they're going to help show us how to do it and how we can go forward. Is that about right, Roger? All right. Welcome, Maureen. OK. Um, yeah, my name is Roger, if you don't know me, from Bristol Radical History Group. Um, and first of all, I'll do the thank yous. Get them out of the way now. And we'll do the proper thank yous later and grab some food. But um, I'd just like to say thank you, first of all, to this, this meeting space to put us on, to be a group. Also, especially to Midnight Notes, and Sylvia and George, and even all the others who helped get us over here. Um, some of us have never been to New York before, some of us have never been to USA. So it's been an interesting and uh, educational experience, I would say. And we've had a great time so far. This, this meeting is entitled uh, Why History Matters and Why Radical History Matters More. Um, and we've, it kind of fits in with the program this week. Yeah, last night at uh, the Brett Forum, we did a presentation about our group uh, and our activities. Um, tonight, we're going to change that a little bit and we're going to actually do some history, hopefully. Uh, so we've got four talks tonight, and I'll go through them in a minute. Um, the plan is, is that we will try and do those talks kind of on the hour. They should last somewhere around 30, 40 minutes. We have time for discussion. So, you know, it's fine if people want to listen to a couple and then leave. I'm sure people will be coming in at different stages. So don't feel like you've got to stay in, you can live off and come back for another talk if you want. If you do leave, they will be deeply offended. So. <laughs> Anyway, last night we talked about four strands of, um, or four kind of analytical approaches that have been developed by a group, and the word I used was praxis last night. The reason I used that is because it means the kind of unification of theory and practice and action, a process. So these four things that I'll go through, these four threads, have kind of developed out of the work we've done. And hopefully there's four case studies tonight that kind of give you an idea about how we've explored those different themes. And those, those, those threads or themes are the following four things. First of all, we're very much interested in uncovering hidden history, particularly local to Bristol, but as Peter's already pointed out, Bristol's a port city, so that kind of connects us across the world to many other places, including New York. Um, secondly, we're, we're very much interested in looking at uh, critiquing established narratives of history, so what I would call establishment histories, dominant ideas in, in, a, in, our, in our various countries and nations, which are up for critique. Thirdly, we've also recently, I would say in the last year or so, begun to look at critiquing established radical narratives. So looking back at previous radical histories over the last 100, 150 years in particular, uh, and, and critiquing those and so we're looking into those, looking into why those histories are presented the way they are. And finally, we're very much interested in connecting all of those bits, hidden histories and critiquing narratives. Um, trying to connect those things with current struggles. So hopefully the four talks tonight will kind of flesh out, that kind of, that, that flesh out those ideas and see, they can see where we, we're coming from with the talks. They should be sort of uh, fairly, fairly obvious, I hope. Um, the four talks are in kind of chronological order. Um, the first one, Steve Mills will be talking about are the Kings of Colliers, a barbarous and ungovernable people. Apparently, I think Steve will explain that to you later on. So that's the first talk. Um, secondly, then I'll be talk, doing a talk called um, From Peterloo to Captain Swing, uh, Victims or Insurgents, looking at 19th century radical histories and critiquing them. Thirdly, uh, Annie Cullen over there will be doing a, a history of the, the suffragettes, or part of the suffragette movement, a movement for enfranchisement of women. Um, and she's looking, it's called Votes for Ladies, the Suffragette Movement from 1903 to 1914. 
And lastly, uh, Rich Rowe, who's sitting behind the computer, will be doing a talk called My Holiday Snaps, which is about the enclosures in India and its experiences when he travelled there the other, a few years ago. So there are four talks. Um, we'll have bits of discussion after them, and then we'll have breaks, and hopefully we won't tire ourselves out and fall asleep. And I'll hand over to Steve. Thank you very much. before I get into the history where we actually are situated within the United Kingdom. As you can see, London is here, Scotland where it rains a lot is up there, and Bristol is here, right on the Seven Channel. And you can see, as we spoke about the slave trade, what an important port it would have been for the hinterlands of the United Kingdom. Bristol, in the period I was speaking about, which is the 18th century, was the second largest city in the UK. In economic importance as well as population, not only in the slave trade, Bristol was prominent in the sugar industry, armaments industry, shipbuilding, um, a whole host of things. And one of, one of the biggest um, coal industries, one of, one of the biggest influences on Bristol was a very large coal field that was situated on, which we're going to see any second now. I thought you were on to that. No, coal field, please, Sorry, mate. Okay, right. <coughs> King, the Kingsman Forest, which I'm going to speak about today, is where this coal field is situated. It's the red here. So if you remember, Bristol's here, it is the Seven Channel. And there is the Kingswood coal field back here. Right? See, we've got other large coal fields here, but this coal field here actually supported Bristol in its early industrial development. It was very important for coal, uh, sorry, for glass making, for the brass industry, but the cannons that were made in Bristol were ships all over the world. The Kingswood Forest here was also, as the name suggests, a massive area of woodland. Um, this was demised over the period I'm going to be talking about, because once again, as I said, shipbuilding, a lot of the actual uh, trees were cut down before the shipbuilding. But I'm going to jump back in time now to the time of William the Bastard, as he was known by his contemporaries, or William the Conqueror, more likely known in today's history books. As you know, he landed around here in 1066 with his mercenary army and quickly spread over the country. In 1087, he got the Doomsday Book together. And the important thing about the Doomsday Book in British culture, it passed the land off. People started to own land. Just about everything, every, every sheep, field, was documented for the purpose of taxation and also state control. But another important thing, all the, all the forests, and there's Kingswood Forest here, there's Chatham up here, there's got lots of different forests, but Crown property, right? Crown property. And one of the most important things about this is it became like, I suppose, a, a holiday park for the monarchs. They could go down there, they would travel out with all their courtiers and such like, and go hunting for game. And what I mean by game, I mean deer, mainly. And they would they'd hunt the game, they'd, they'd set up wardens and look after the game during the, when the king wasn't there, or the queen wasn't there. And basically, they would keep an eye on the forest and make sure it was well stocked with game and it was you know, in good order. But as you can see, I mean, the coal field roughly is about the size of the forest. It was a large expanse of land. And we've all heard about like, people in history, like Robin Hood, for example. It was a magnet for outlaws. You know, if you, if you were outlaws from the legal system, for one reason or another, a lot of people would escape to the forest to meet the like-minded people, and they would squat the land there. Now, squatting is very interesting. Have, have you all heard about common lands? Do you know what I'm speaking about? I speak about common land. Basically, it's, it's still own land, but it was land that wasn't actually utilized by, by the ruling class of that particular area, and people could utilize the stuff on the, on the land for whole various reasons. They could take wood for building, and for, for fuel, etc. get berries, they could um, graze their sheep or their oxen or their horses on there. But one of the most important things that I've found about Common Land, that's a very quick synopsis by the way. There's lots and lots of books written about Common Land. But one, one of the most important things about it is a lot of it was handed down from generation by word of mouth. There's not a great deal written down about it. But one of the most important things I feel about Common Land is the people who actually worked and used the commons held the key to sustainability. So for example, if you suddenly brought a couple of new cows and you wanted to graze them on the common land, you might be refused for a simple reason. 
that it will not be able to sustain those extra pounds that are thrown upon the land now. And that is something I believe that we've lost in the current current age, and that's what we need to be So I wish you all that.